Good evening, friends, and welcome again to the Pinnacle of Prophecy, unlocking Revelation's mystery. I want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world for this in-depth Bible study. We also want to welcome those who are here in person. Thank you for coming out this evening. Very important presentation, so I'm really glad to see you all here this evening. Hopefully you have your lessons in hand and you are ready for our study. For those who are watching, if you would like to get the whole set of lessons, the color version of the lessons, you can do so by just taking a picture of the QR code that you see on your screen. That's to order all of the lessons or just go to the Amazing Facts website, amazingfacts.com or .org. Click on the link that says store and you can order the lessons that way. If you'd like to get a black and white copy, just a PDF of tonight's lesson that you can follow along and fill in the answers, you can download one for free at the Pinnacle of Prophecy website, pinnacleofprophecy.com. We want to encourage you to do so. Tonight, a very important subject. It's lesson number 10, and we encourage you to download that. We also have a free offer that we want to tell you about. This is one of Amazing Facts' sharing magazines. It's called The Bible Truth About Hell, and we will send this to anyone for free. It's actually a digital download that you can get. To receive that, just take a picture of the QR code, or you can text the word HELL7 to the number 40544. If you're outside of North America, once again, go to pinnacleofprophecy.com. That's the website. You'll be able to download the magazine, read it, and then you can even email it to somebody else. You can share it with other people. Well, we have a theme song that we have been singing throughout the series. It's Jesus Shine On Me. I'd like to invite our song leaders to come out. And you know how we do this. We're going to invite you to stand and sing out nice and loud, Jesus Shine On Me. We're going to sing it two times. Jesus shine on me everywhere I go when I follow fast and if I listen slow on bright mountains high in dark valleys low Jesus shine on me everywhere I go Jesus shine on me you ladies. I hope those of you are watching online, you singing along with us. Just a wonderful song. Let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity once again to gather together and open your word and study a very important subject, one that is, well, misunderstood by many in the Christian world. So we do invite your presence, ask your spirit to come and guide our minds. And as we study the word, make the truth clear and plain. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We want to thank those who are watching for all of the Bible questions that have been sent in, and also those who are here. We've had some great questions, and we're going to get to that portion of our time right now, where Pastor Doug and Karen Batchelor are going to be answering your Bible questions. So, Pastor Doug, Karen, time is yours. Thank you, Pastor Ross, and good, good evening. evening, friends. Boy, I'm so impressed with your faithfulness with all that's going on in the world, and you having survived all the isolation from the last couple of years, you're coming out faithfully even in the middle of the week. Welcome to those here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church and to our friends watching on 3ABN, Hope Channel, Good News Network, Facebook, YouTube. AFTV. AFTV, thank you. You're welcome. And we're just so glad you're all watching. And we have, I think, a very important and exciting study for tonight, but we're going to get in as many questions as we can. Well, now, did you want to see the groups that are watching Oh, first? thank you. Yeah, we've got, uh, I think we've got some more groups that are, have sent in little pictures that are gathering around the world that are studying with us. So we have our friend from Hangzhou, China, and Puerto Rico. And the next slide. From Norway and Uganda. And from Redding, California, we did our a meeting there in 1993. Do you remember? That's right. Yep. And Colorado. Ignacio, Colorado. And Waterford, California. And Chicago. 
Fremont, California, and the Philippines. Amen. We're so thankful that you guys are sending in your pictures and that you're watching with us. And we just pray that the Lord will continue to bless your groups and that the Holy Spirit will uh, be with you as you learn more and more of these Bible truths. Amen. Yeah, we've got folks all over the world that are watching us in addition to the networks. And we're just so thankful. All right. All right. Questions. So Question number one, Revelation 14, 15 and the verses surrounding it talk about an angel reaping the harvest on earth. Does this refer to the rapture of Christians? No, that's actually uh, the angel that's coming there to reap. It's not a good thing. You know, it tells us in the parable of the wheat and the tares that uh, Jesus is going to send angels to bind the tares in bundles and burn them. And so this is a harvest where uh, they're being executed. And so the Lord is coming to save. There's, but, you know, angels are involved in both the right harvest and the wrong harvest. Jesus also said he'll send forth his angels to gather together his elect from the four corners of the earth. But uh, this is not the rapture that it's talking about. You mentioned that the Bible says we should not work on the Sabbath. How does that apply to health care workers? The Bible says that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. All right, let's get something straight. A lot of questions are framed this way. It says, you said, is it me that said you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath? Or is it like God, the Ten Commandments? So I just, I want to make sure we don't get those two mixed up. So people say, well, you say, it's not me. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Now, what about health care workers? You know, obviously, people that uh, are in the hospitals or that they need care, God wants us to care for them. Did Jesus heal on the Sabbath day? He did. And, you know, there are certain emergency services. Uh, there are practical things. When you're in Israel and they were attacked on the Sabbath, did their armies say, don't bother us until sundown? No. no you, there's things you have to do in emergencies. And, of course, caring for the sick. Now, let's suppose you are, uh, Karen's a physical therapist, and every now and then there were patients that needed, after surgery, they need care immediately after, whatever the day of the week was, uh, she would either schedule with people that went to church on Sunday so that, she, can I swap schedules with you? Because you don't want to be working every Sabbath where you miss your worship. And she would also take that money then and donate it if she had to be there sometimes. So, you know, you want to be practical, mix it up so that if you're in the health care, you don't, they say seven days without church makes one week. You don't want to keep missing your church time. You get it. W-E-E-K and W-E-A-K. Ron got it here on the front row. All right. Based upon Amos 3, 7, do you think God might reveal a more definitive time for Jesus' second coming? Close to the actual time like he did for Jesus' first coming. Uh, Amos 3 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So since the Lord is going to do nothing significant without revealing it to his prophets, wouldn't he reveal the day and the hour of the Lord's coming? Uh, no, Jesus made it pretty clear that no man knows that day or the hour, and I don't think he wants us to know it. But did the Lord reveal to his prophets that Jesus is coming? Yes. And did Jesus say he can know and he told us through his prophets when that time is near? So the Lord has given us uh, information when we know it's near. How many of you wait until a couple of days before your tax returns before you file? Come on, fess up. I've seen the mailbox, everybody lined up. <laughs> if the Lord said, I'm coming, you know, and he gave you a date, some of you would just, uh, you know, you'd go to Vegas until two days before. So you got to be ready all the time. Amen? All right. Can Satan or his angels read our minds? Maybe. No. <laughs> the, re the reason I say that is, no, he cannot read your mind. The Bible says God, and this is in 2 Kings chapter 9, you have to check on me. It's maybe 32, King Solomon's prayer. He said, thou and thou only know the hearts of the sons of men. Only God can read your mind. The Gospel of John, it says, Jesus, he knew what was in man. And you see several times where it says Christ knew what they were thinking. He knew Simon was thinking within himself. If this man was a prophet, he would not let that woman touch him. Jesus knew their thoughts. God knows your thoughts. You can pray in your heart to God. But in the sense that the devil can plant a temptation in your mind, and then he can look at your body language and your expression and kind of know if he's getting through. Mm -hmm. I can kind of tell what she's thinking sometimes without her saying anything because we've been married and I sort of know her. 
look at the body language. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell. <laughs> I have to be very demonstrative, though. <laughs> so it's really bad. When I'm preaching, she sits there, she signals me. She goes, <laughs> honest. I, I appreciate it. Most of sometimes I'll true. say the wrong thing, yeah. And sometimes she'll go, <laughs> or she'll go, <laughs> or I'll say, no, don't say that. I'll say, that. you know, I'm thinking of telling you a story. She'll go, <laughs> not that one, not that one. And then we got this one. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. That's all true. That's true. All right. <laughs> Do we have to go to church and be baptized in order to go to heaven and be saved? Well, you don't have to be baptized in a church, but Jesus gave a pretty clear command. Whoever believes in is baptized will be saved. A baptism is a command for any believer who is able. We have said there's exceptions, of course, and baptism will not prevent you from getting to heaven if you can't be. Some people come to the Lord and they're in foreign prisons that just will not accommodate a baptism. Will the Lord still forgive them? Yes, he'll give them credit for the, uh, his baptism. And do you need to go to a church? The Bible says that we are baptized into Christ. The church is called the body of Christ. We are part of one body. If I was to ask you to look at the person next to you and say, do they have a nose? You can check. You can go ahead if you want to check. <laughs> is anyone shocked by that? No, but if I said, look on the floor, a nose, that'd be kind of creepy, wouldn't it? Because it belongs on a face. When you are a Christian, you are part of a body and you need to be connected. Severed from the body, a limb will die mm -hmm. and you need to be connected. I know the church isn't perfect, people aren't perfect and that's why God wants us part of the church because you learn to love and they learn to love you Amen. and you need to be part of that family. What happened to the saints who were brought back to life when Jesus was resurrected? Did they go to heaven as well or live on earth and die again? Well, you can read where it says Jesus led captivity captive in the New Testament and well, they appeared to many after the resurrection and when Jesus ascended, I'm sure that they ascended with him. Uh, it's not even mentioned in the Gospels of Mark, Luke, and John. Just Matthew mentions this, I think it's chapter 27. And there was a small group that were resurrected that sort of went to heaven like a first fruits trophy with the Lord. And I'm sure they did ascend. They didn't die again. Is speaking in tongues the proof of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Am I not saved if I don't speak in tongues? Yeah, good question. You know, I've got a lot of dear friends out there that are coming from charismatic persuasions. And when I first came to the Lord, I attended a uh, Pentecostal charismatic church, a few different ones. And so I understand the subject, uh, but in all honesty, I think it's uh, a mistake to teach people that you have to speak in tongues. And I think the gift of tongues is often misunderstood. It tells us in the book of Acts, the gift of tongues was God gave these Galilean men the supernatural ability to speak in languages they did not formally know or study for the purpose of preaching the gospel in those languages. It was not some un unknown utterance that nobody understood. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, said, if you're going to speak in a language without a translator, keep silent. Mm -hmm. Paul said, I'd rather speak five words where with my understanding I might instruct others and 10,000 in an unknown tongue. If I should stand here now and say, Sotik Malkrusia, they understood that in Micronesia. No one else did. It's not doing you any good. Uh, you need to speak so people understand. Paul said, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. Otherwise, it's like a trumpet that gives the wrong signal in a battle. No one knows how to respond. So do you need to speak in tongues? Does it say anywhere that the fruit of the Spirit is tongues? Tongues is one of the gifts of the Spirit. It's a gift of speaking languages and translating languages. And there is a supernatural gift that some people have. And another night I'll tell you a story about that. But Are you going to share your story about speaking in tongues? Another night. Oh, another yeah. night. Okay. Why do good people suffer and a lot of bad people seem to succeed? This is the big question in the book of Job. Uh, it says Job is a perfect and an upright man and the devil goes after him to try to shake his faith. The Lord allows him to be tested and because of the faithfulness of Job, uh, it strengthened our faith. 
And the question that's being asked in Job, his friends are saying, all this is happening to you. You must have done something wrong because only bad things happen to bad people. And Job is saying that's not true. Sometimes it looks like that the wicked are prospering and their children are healthy and their business is succeeding and, and you see righteous people going through trials and, and uh, generally speaking, it is better to serve the Lord. But we can see, doesn't Jesus say, God sends the sunshine and the rain on the just and the unjust. Blessings and trials come to everybody. And it's because there is a devil the arch fiend rampaging through this world that's causing all kinds of problems and suffering. So the book of Job answers that question. Was Jesus good? Yes. Did he suffer? Yes. There's your answer. And second Peter Jesus, talks yeah. a lot about suffering. Yeah, don't as well. be amazed at the fiery trials that will try you as though some strange thing happened. Good and bad comes to everybody. It gives us the opportunity to have our faith grown mm -hmm. and uh, and trust in the Lord and really petition and Amen. walk closer. A lot of people will say that after they've had a really difficult time that they felt that they were closest to the Lord during those times. Yeah. I don't know if you've experienced that. but I, We've got Amazing Facts has a big prison ministry. We do a Bible school for thousands of prisoners and so many of them have written and said, I found Jesus in prison. Prison was the best thing that happened to me. On the outside, I would have killed myself. The Lord brought me here to save me. And they're praising God that they're in prison. Now that's unusual to do that. Why can't I stop smoking cigarettes? I was doing hard drugs 10 years ago, and the Lord helped me beat them all. Cigarettes are the only thing I have left. But I can't seem to stop. I've been doing a lot of praying. What should I do? You can, and we'll pray for you. There's a lot of people out there that struggle with addictions. And by the way, whatever your addictions are, the last ones are the hardest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's whatever's lingering. I used to smoke, and... I quit drinking, I quit drugs, I quit a lot of things. One of the hardest things for me was cigarettes. They say the addiction to cigarettes can be as hard as heroin. Um, and uh, I know it is a struggle, but uh, there's about 10 billion people that can testify. Well, maybe not that many. Millions that can Ten testify. Billion, there's only eight on the planet. Well, but I'm thinking through time. I'm thinking of since Sir Walter Raleigh brought it back to Europe. Okay. Um, that have gotten the victory. And so I... My grandfather smoked for 50 years, and he tried and tried, and he couldn't quit. And then one day he went to the hospital for a stomach ailment, and he had to share the room with another patient. And the man in the bed next to him, my grandfather said he saw him light a cigarette, and then he put it to his throat to smoke the cigarette because he had had his voice box removed, and he was breathing, breathing through what he called tracheotomy or... Yeah. And yeah. he saw the guy smoking through his throat. My grandfather said, that was it. I threw away my lucky strikes, and I never smoked again. He lived to 93. So, and he smoked 50 years. He, it just took that to, to crack the nut. God can give you victory. Believe it, friends. Amen? I mean, whatever just, it is, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, he can save you. Just keep praying. And keep, yeah, keep, keep praying, and, and keep don't praying. quit quitting. That's right. You know how many times I quit before I quit? Mark Twain quit, said, quitting smoking is the easiest thing in the world. I've done it a hundred times. <laughs> but I probably quit about seven, eight times before I quit for good. Yeah. So don't give up. And I haven't had a cigarette in 40 years. And, so. and there are programs, too, to help stop smoking. Yeah. That's so, right. After Jesus comes and takes us to heaven, will we be in... Uh, will we, <laughs> I'm going to try that again. <laughs> after Jesus comes and takes us to heaven, will we be there for a thousand years? And what will we be doing? Yeah, if you look in Revelation 20, that's where you find the thousand years described. And we call that the millennium. Though the word millennium doesn't appear in the Bible, it simply means thousand years, milli annum. And some people think that the saints are on earth during the thousand years, reigning over the wicked. It does say we live and reign with Christ. It doesn't say we are on earth, and it doesn't say we're reigning over the wicked. It's really bizarre to think that the righteous have glorified immortal bodies and they're reigning over the wicked. First of all, I don't want to reign over the wicked. And that the wicked are dying and they've got their sinful bodies and we're going to be down here in a sinful world with glorified bodies. No. When Jesus left, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again in my Father's house and many mansions. I will receive you that where I am you may be. What direction do we go when Jesus comes? Uh we live and reign with him in glory up in heaven. 
uh, sharing our testimonies of, to the uh, holy beings of how God has saved us. At the end of the 1,000 years, I saw in the New Jerusalem, millennium is Revelation 20, Revelation 21, I saw the New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. Then God, it says the wicked surround the city of God, God rains fire down out of heaven, that's in our study tonight, devours them, he creates a new heaven, a new earth. It's in heaven where we spend the millennium, not here. And what will we be doing there? Well, we're going to be asking lots of questions, for one thing. Uh, I'm going to be asking, I want to, well, I won't tell you that. <laughs> All right, we're I got a lot go of on. questions. <laughs> um, I was baptized as a youth, left the church as a young adult, and came back to church as a real adult. I have been in church for years now, but do I need to get rebaptized? Well, maybe. Um, one thing I've found is that, uh, you know, whenever you're in doubt, do the safe thing. Uh, don't try and see how close to the line of the world you can get. Stay as far away as possible. And if your conscience continues to prod you, it may be the Holy Spirit that's saying, you know, you really kind of left the Lord uh, and you've been, you know, you were gone for years. If you get discouraged and you stay away and miss church for a month, you don't have to get rebaptized whenever you go through a, a spell like that. Talk to your pastor. It may be appropriate for you to get a new beginning. Now, if you've left and you come back, don't get baptized right away. Make sure you're settled into your commitment because mm -hmm. you get baptized and fall away again. Then you get discouraged. You think, I'll never make it. But if you've been consistent, you've got a new beginning, you may want to get baptized. And you also have foot washing. Foot washing yeah. is also a Every time baptism. you do the communion service, and you know, in our church, along with the Primitive Baptists and a number of other churches, we practice what they call a full communion where we not only have the bread and wine, but Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He said, if I've washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet because I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. And that's John 13. So we do all three in our church. Right, and our wine is grape juice. Yes, unfermented grape juice, unleavened bread. All right, we've run out of time for questions, but if you'd like to send in your picture from where you're studying, please uh, send it to pop at amazingfacts.org. And if you want to send in any more Bible questions, we are compiling the top rated questions. Just send those in to the QR code. Aim your camera there with a question. It'll lead you to a website. And then we will do our very best to answer as many as we can. Well, I think we've got a few moments now, Pastor Ross, for a little pinnacle perspective on some things we've talked about that need a little more attention. That's right. Well, good evening again, Pastor Doug and friends who are watching. Last night you spoke about what happens when a person dies. And the Bible's pretty clear that a person rests or sleeps. You mean the Bible says. Was that Sunday? Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. It was Sunday. <laughs> that uh, a person is in the grave until the resurrection when Jesus comes again. And the yeah. Bible's clear on that. But there are a couple of passages of Scripture that people often ask. And uh, we're going to take one of the big ones here. It's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So... What we're going to do is we're going to read this. I'm going to, I think they'll put the words up on the screen for those who are watching. And then, Pastor Dave, you can talk about it and kind of explain a little bit. So, Luke chapter 16 is where you find it. Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and feared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being tormented in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off with Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all of this, between us and you, there is a great goal fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to there cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Verse 27. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he might testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Verse 31, But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So is Jesus talking about what happens when a person dies, or is there a broader lesson that we find in this parable? First thing is remember, it is a parable, and it comes on the heels of a list of parables. You have in chapter 15, you've got the parable of the lost son, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the unfaithful steward, and then this parable. So when you have a parable, uh, coins don't talk, they're not real, it's an illustration, okay? Here, what Jesus is saying really has nothing to do with the state of the dead and whether the dead, I mean, think about it. Do you think the people in heaven are going to be talking to the people in hell? Let's hope not. Would one drop of water coming from Abraham or from Lazarus to the rich man in Hades, would it really cool him in that torment? Um, so th this is a, a parable, and I think it's pretty clear that um, this is really illustrating you've got a rich man who represents the Jewish nation, clothed in purple, feasting on the truth. Uh, it says Lazarus, he's at his gate, he's on the outside, and the only comfort he gets is from the dogs that lick his sores. The Jews looked upon the Gentiles as cursed and unclean. If you, were, you had sores, you were unclean. They called the Gentiles dogs. Everything in the wording is talking about the Gentiles. But the rich man doesn't love his neighbor that is starving for the crumbs, the bread of life the rich man's feasting on. The Jews built the wall around the city. They were all feasting on the Bible and arguing the Bible and debating the Bible. And the Gentiles were dying for the truth that they were starving for. And Jesus said, you may be shocked to find that in the judgment, the rich man is going to the Greek mythology place of torment. Hades was run by Pluto. We don't, the Bible doesn't teach Pluto. Jesus uses the word Hades. And he's got the poor man going to Abraham's bosom, an illustration of where the, every Jew wanted to be. Nowhere else in the Bible does it say we all die and go to Abraham's bosom. Think about it, friends. If everybody that dies goes to Abraham's bosom, how big is his bosom? Isn't this a figure of speech? So Jesus isn't trying to say anything about the state of men and death. He's trying to say, and it's to the church, not the Jews, not only the Jews. He's saying, if we have the Bible, we have the truth, and we just get together and talk about it and feast on it, and we don't care about the beggars that are starving and dying around us, we may find in the judgment that they're on the inside and we're on the outside where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth because we didn't love our brother. That's the message has nothing to do with people in heaven and hell talking to each other. Heaven forbid, amen? That you could be communicating with people you knew when you were alive and they're burning in torment. And of course, it's also interesting to note that Jesus did resurrect someone by the name of Lazarus and still the religious leaders didn't believe. Yeah, and the punchline, forgive the term punchline, but it means the end of the story, the main moral of the story, Jesus said, if you believe not Moses and the prophets, then neither will you be persuaded though one should rise from the dead. Moses and the prophets said that Jesus was the Messiah. They did not believe it. Even the resurrection did not persuade them. They paid the Roman soldiers to say the body was stolen. They refused to believe the clear evidence that he had risen. Okay, one quick other verse here. Uh, the thief on the cross, this is in Luke chapter 23. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said, assuredly I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. Does that mean Jesus and the thief, they were in paradise that day? No, this is an example of where the punctuation was misplaced. The way this really reads, Jesus is hanging on the cross. The thief had the faith to say, Lord, when Jesus is hanging there dying naked, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He called him king. He called him Lord. Jesus said, I may not look like a Lord today. I may not look like a king. But today I am promising you will be with me in paradise. He was not saying you will be with me in paradise today because Jesus did not go to paradise that day. He told Mary, I've not yet ascended to my father Sunday morning. So that's the only way you can understand that. That verse should not be used to say you die and go right to heaven or hell. And of course, the, the thief said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Right. So he wasn't expecting any reward that day. But when he comes. When he comes again, he was to point. get the reward. Again, we want to thank those who are tuning in, ready for our study, a very important lesson. So if you don't have the lesson, you can download that from the website. We're going to start our study in just a moment.
Welcome back, friends, to the Pinnacle of Prophecy. We're ready for our study this evening. It's lesson number 10. It's entitled, The Flames of Justice. So if you don't have a copy of the lesson, you can download yours at pinnacleofprophecy.com, and you can study along. And of course, those of you who are here in person, you might want to open up your lesson, get your pen ready so you can fill in the answers as we go through our study this evening. But before Pastor Doug comes and shares with us, we have Malia and Aaliyah that are going to be bringing us the song, Wonderful, Merciful Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Thank you so much, Aaliyah, Malia, Jackie, beautiful song, amen? Are your hearts hungering for the Lord and the truth, friends? I want to welcome you once again to the Pinnacle of Prophecy program. This is a brand new Bible study series based on Revelation 14, and that chapter is sort of a place that coalesces a lot of the prophecies for the last days, and that's why we focus on this. 14 presentations, and we are in lesson number 10 tonight dealing with one of my favorite subjects. Now, it might sound strange to you, but I'm going to share with you the good news about hell. And the lesson is titled, The Flames of Justice. You know, uh, we always like to begin with an amazing fact. And in 1666, ominous number right there, a bakery in London caught on fire, and it rapidly began to spread all throughout the city, 13,000 houses were destroyed, 87 churches, including St. Paul's Cathedral, 
It's called the Great Fire of London. And though it devastated much of the city, uh, many believe it may have been a blessing in disguise because they had been suffering from the bubonic plague and the plague stopped following the fire. They believe it's because it eradicated the rats and the fleas that had been causing it. Sometimes fire purifies. And the Bible speaks of a day when this whole world is going to be purified by fire and God is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. Now there's a lot of confusion in the world regarding the subject of the punishment of the wicked. Our memory verse that comes to us from Revelation chapter 14, it's the foundation for our study, is Revelation chapter 14, 10. It says, And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Very ominous words. What does this mean? The punishment of the righteous and the punishment of the wicked. Now, if you want to understand what's going to happen in the future, the Bible is full of stories. It's the stories in the Bible that help us to understand the theology. The Bible is full of stories. You want to understand salvation? Look at how he saved the nation of Israel. If you want to understand something about Jesus' forgiveness, look at Joseph and his brothers, how he forgave what they did to him. Uh, just about every doctrine in the Bible is illustrated somehow in a story. And yes, even the subject of hell and the lake of fire is illustrated in Genesis 19 with the story of Lot. Lot is the nephew of Abraham. They part ways because their flocks and herds are too big. Lot looks down in the valley, back then known as the Valley of Sodom. It's the Jordan Valley, and it says it was watered like the garden of the Lord. It used to be beautiful, tropical, and had an abundance of everything. And the, the land was so productive that Ezekiel said that they not only had uh, idleness of time and fullness of bread, but they gave themselves over to sexual immorality. You've heard the expression, idleness is the devil's workshop. Well, they had a lot of idleness, and they had a lot of bad behavior. I think we all know the names of those cities have become synonymous with some uh, infamous sins. And so um, it tells us that finally Abraham pleads for Lot and his family. God sends angels to deliver them. He barely is able to get his wife and two daughters out of town just in time. And God says through the angel, whatever you do, do not look back. And Lot and his daughters and his wife, when they went out of Sodom, God rained upon the city fire and brimstone out of heaven. And it also destroyed the city and the land. And if you go look at the land there around the Jordan Valley, it is the lowest place on planet Earth, and it is barren, hot, desolate, full of salts, and nothing grows. And the shortest verse in the Bible, or one of the shortest verses in the Bible, is where Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. He says this regarding the last days. The Lord tells us there's going to come a time in the last days where God's people are going to have to flee. Did you know that? He said, when you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. If you're in the rooftop, do not even go down to get anything out of your house. He said, a time's going to come where you're going to have to run. Do not look back. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. We may not be very far from that day. When the Lord calls us, we need to be willing to go and not think about the things of this world. Don't look back. We know that Lot and his family, they got out of Sodom just in time and God rained that fire and brimstone out of heaven. And the Bible says that is an example of how God is going to deal with the punishment of the wicked. Now before we get into our study, I just want to set the stage for you and tell you what I believe, tell you what I'm going to say, and then I'll tell you what I said. On the subject of hell, there are two extremes. One extreme is sort of the universal view that God just puts hell in the Bible to discourage bad behavior. In the end, he's going to save everybody. That it's only a, a, it's a figure, it's an allegory, it's not real. And then you got the other extreme, which is the superheated Baptist version of hell, that if a person dies unsaved, they're going to be plunged into this molten lake of fire and brimstone where they are going to burn 
and never be consumed, but they will feel the pain of the fire moment by moment, shrieking in unutterable agony. I hate to even think about it, but I, I want, I, you have to be a little graphic to understand the, the danger of the doctrine. A few years ago, a Jordanian pilot was shot down, captured by ISIS. He was actually a son of a general. And um, ISIS then put him in a cage and they videotaped as they doused him with some gasoline or something and then set him on fire. And the idea of doing that to somebody, and it, it took a long time for him to die. You know, the church used to burn martyrs at the stake. And sometimes the martyrs would be burning. They'd say, please bring more wood. It's taking too long. I mean, it was just terrible. The, the idea of burning for a minute is unimaginable. And yet, there are people that say God is going to take these creatures that are born with a natural tendency to sin. How many will admit we're all born with sort of a natural tendency to sin? And then if we don't straighten up, if we don't learn to love God, He's going to burn us forever and ever. Now there's a great motivator to love somebody. And ever and ever. Now think about that. A billion years go by, you've been burning in agony for a billion years and you've never begun. It never ends. So many people have turned away from God. I did. I, I went to two different Catholic schools, and it's not just Catholics, but many Christians misunderstand the scriptures on this subject. And then the other group says, you know, there is no lake of fire, there is no hell. I want to tell you what the Bible says. Friends, do you believe the Bible? And I think when you know the truth on this, you're going to find it's liberating because it'll help you have the right perspective on how God is just and yet loving at the same time. So let's get into the lesson and see what the Bible does teach. Question number one. To what is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah compared in the Bible? Answer, and you can say the answers with me when we get to them. This is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, 6, and 9. If God, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, then he knows how to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. First of all, Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of what God's going to do to the wicked. Are they still burning today? The Bible says they're being reserved for a day of judgment. Is anybody burning in hell now? No, the day of judgment's not come yet. So that's one thing we learn from this. Look at Jude verse 6 and 7. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the day, for the judgment of the great day, future, reserved, correct? Such as Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth as an example. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah is an example. Sodom and Gomorrah, friends, are not an allegory. It is real. If you go down to the Jordan Valley, you can see in the hills embedded in the, the dried petrified ash there, sulfur balls. I want to show you something here. Now, I've not done this in a long time, and there's a certain amount of risk with it, so I hope you pray for me as we proceed. <laughs> no, it's not a magic trick. This is a sulfur ball that was brought, picked out of the hills in the south part of the Dead Sea where Sodom was. It is the only place in the world you are going to find brimstone, little pieces that did not burn because they were covered by ash, embedded in the mountains. There's no other place on earth like this. This is real sulfur. This is living evidence. Someone sent this to me in 2005. I've got a few of them. In fact, if you think I'm making this up, uh, Debbie on the camera there has been there. She's picked them out of the hills herself down there by the Dead Sea. This is real. Sodom was real. Fire and brimstone fell on that area. Now, if I can get this right here. I 
I'm going to see if it's like, if I get it on fire, I'm not going to leave it on fire for very long because it smells like burning eggs. It's not good for you. It's burning right now. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. See the blue flame? Do you see it? It's burning. Hard to put out. Uh-oh, I think I got it. All right, Ricky, before the fire alarm goes off, thank you very much. <laughs> Did you all see it? In a moment, you're going to smell it. But I just demonstrated something. I just, re I just revived history for you of something that actually did happen. It was very real. A whole community was destroyed. I actually have wet wipes up here because my fingers are going to stink like sulfur now if I don't do that. There's living testimony just embedded in the hills out there that this was real. And the whole geography was transformed by it. It used to be a beautiful valley, watered like the Garden of God, and it turned into the most desolate place on the earth, and there are pillars of salt everywhere, and they called them all Lot's wife. Uh, I don't know that they were all Lot's wife, but anyway. So here's a picture of the sulfur balls. You can see what one of them looks like when it's still. Let's put that on the screen for the people here. This is what they look like when you see them. It just rained fire and brimstone on this spot. And you just saw that. How many of you smell it? Yeah. People the front row, sorry about that. This is what's going to happen in the last days. The wicked, Revelation chapter 20, they surround the city of God and God rains fire out of heaven upon them and devours them. What happens to them? Burn forever and ever or devoured? If everybody burns forever and ever, think about this for a second. Cain killed Abel. How many people did he kill? One that we know of. And if he went to hell 6,000 years ago and Adolf Hitler burned, or he killed 6 million people and he's going to punish Adolf Hitler the same amount of time he's going to punish Cain? You got some 16-year-old. They've reached the age of accountability and they die lost. God's going to burn them forever and ever and ever, just like he would Pol Pot or Stalin. Where's the justice in that? The Bible says every man is rewarded according to his works. If everybody burns forever and ever and ever, everybody's getting the same reward. But evidently, Jesus said, he who knew his master's will and did not do it, he will be beaten with many stripes. He who did not know is beaten with few stripes. There are varying degrees of time and intensity in the punishment of the wicked. Does that make sense? God is a just God. So what is the purpose of hellfire? So God can get even with people? No. It's because he's putting the wicked out of their misery, really, and he's cleansing the planet. Revelation 21, verse 4. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more what? No more death, nor Sorrow, nor crying. How can, be, how can you have this torture chamber in the universe full of people shrieking if there's no more crying? And there shall be no more, no more, no more pain. God is not going to have a universe with pain. To immortalize pain, to immortalize Satan, the Bible says he's eradicated. And again, speaking of will sin ever rise up again, Nahum chapter 1 verse 9 says, Sin shall not rise up the... People ask, well, you know, if the devil went bad, how do we know it's not going to happen again? The whole universe will have a living testimony of what sin did to God and to the universe. This world, unfortunately, is the theater to the universe that is demonstrating the terrible experiment with sin. Nobody is going to want to tamper with that again. You know, all of us at some point in our life, we touch something hot and... Uh, once or twice you may have grabbed a live wire and you said, I only got to do that once. And you're not going to do it again. No one's going to want to sin again. No one's going to doubt God's love again after seeing the love of God at the cross. They see Satan's power, uh, love for power and Jesus' power of love at the cross. Question three. Who are the lost according to the Bible? Matthew chapter 13 verse 41 and 42 the Son of Man will send out His angels 
and gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. Remember what I said about the angels going out to gather? All things that offend and those who practice the lost are the ones who practice what? You know what lawlessness means? People who are not living by the law. The other night I preached about the law of God and some people thought I was being legalistic. You know what Jesus said? Whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so, he will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Meaning the people in heaven call that person least. They're not there. But whosoever shall do and teach will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So I want to do and I want to teach what God's law says. Because the law of the Lord drives us to Jesus where we find salvation and liberty. Who else is the lost? It says the who? The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Not only the devil, but his angels. Depart from me, Matthew 25, 41. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, somebody caught that there. Pastor Doug, it says right there, everlasting fire. Well, it is everlasting fire. What that simply means is the result of that fire is everlasting. There are saints that were burnt, but it was not an everlasting fire because they're going to be resurrected. Backstage, I've got a guitar made of wood. I could set it on fire and burn it, and I'll, that go, the guitar is going to be gone forever. What the fire does to that guitar is everlasting. It's simply saying the results of this fire are going to be everlasting. The devil will never come back again. doesn't mean it continues to burn forever and ever. And that's where I think a lot of the misunderstanding comes in. Earlier this year, Mrs. Batchelor and I were in Rome, and we stopped and visited a famous site. It'll be my second time there, called Pompeii. Now, you all know the story about Pompeii, and um, I'm not going to show the pictures because this message is disturbing enough as it is, but they've got all these forms of people that were caught and buried by uh, hot ash in all different positions, and they were basically burnt alive, and they uncovered the city in the 1800s. Um, it had been really buried and preserved since 79 A.D. Mount Vesuvius exploded, caught a lot of people off guard, and it was something like Sodom and Gomorrah. Hot ash and fire rained down upon the city. A pyroclastic cloud came down, and many were burnt uh, others trying to escape. And you can just tell from the people frozen in time the different stories. Uh, one thing I thought was very interesting is as we went on a tour through the city for almost a full day, uh, it's pretty clear from the frescoes on the wall and what our tour guide was sharing with us that this was the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire. Uh, they had bordellos all over the place, and it seemed like that was the most popular spot for people to visit when they were on tour. And um, there's a lot of sin in the city theaters. It was all about uh, fun and entertainment. And God had sent them several warnings. There were earthquakes a few days before the eruption. The spring stopped flowing. Uh, a lot of thinking people said something's going to happen, and a few of them left town. But most of them were caught unaware, and the fire just rained down upon them and destroyed them. Well, if Jesus did what he did to Sodom, I remember hearing Billy Graham. I've heard this attributed to Billy Graham and his wife, and they may both be true, because sometimes my wife says something, I quote her. And Ruth Graham said, either God is going to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah or the world is in big trouble. Because the things for which God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah are rife in our culture today. And it wasn't just sexual perversion, but that was one of the sins. It specifically meant, uh, meets that out in the New and the Old Testament, but it said they didn't care for the wicked. They were fullness of bread, idleness, and pride. And it describes the world today, just hedonism, living for pleasure. And the earth is waxing old like a garment. God is going to punish this world. The Bible says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the things in it will be burned up. Number four, what happens to the lost in hellfire? Psalm 37, verse 20. The wicked will perish, 
And then, wait a second now. One of the best proofs for the two options. See, the devil said, you don't really die. You either live forever in heaven or you live forever in hell. Haven't you heard that? But what did Jesus say? Who's, what, who knows what's the most popular verse? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have as opposed to everlasting life, you have another option. What's the other option? Perish. What does perish mean? Cease to exist. You know what words God uses to describe the wicked? He says they will perish, they will die, they will be consumed, they'll be devoured, they're turned to ashes, they are no more. Those are Bible words to describe the punishment of the wicked. Does that sound like this medieval picture that they're being tormented forever and ever in flames? You know how many people have been driven mad by that teaching or driven away from God? I can think of so many brilliant people that wanted to believe in God. You got Charles Darwin. He couldn't understand the punishment of the wicked being tormented forever and he kind of turned his back on God. Father was a pastor. Karl Marx same thing. Robert Ingersoll, Mark Twain. Mark Twain's brother was injured in a boiler, a riverboat boiler. He was badly burned and he watched his brother slowly die. And he thought, I can't imagine this suffering and God doing this to people forever that don't believe in him. How can a God like that be a God of love? So many people have been turned away. And there have been parents that have been driven mad because they have children that they know died lost. And they think, while I walk the earth, my child is now writhing in fire and brimstone. And can you see why that would drive a person, if they love their children, mad? But that's not what the Bible teaches. And it's like, uh, who was it? Jonathan Edwards would preach this sermon, a famous, he was a good preacher, but he had this sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And uh, he would be preaching about hell and he'd get so dramatic that people in the pews would beg him to stop because they were so terrified. Does God want us to serve him because we're afraid or because we love him? So I was driving across Texas one day, Christmas Eve, with the family, driving a, kids were little, I'm driving a little Mazda GLC, the old one, very small. It had a half-cylinder engine. <laughs> a little rice burner. I tell you that because in Texas, I bought it in California. Back then, they didn't even allow Japanese cars to be sold in Texas. <laughs> and I'm driving down the road, out two laid road out in the middle of nowhere and on our way home, and we saw that there was a family with a hood up broken down on the side of the road. So I'm, I pulled over, and uh, the man was telling me, him and his wife and two daughters were on their way for visit family for Christmas. And um, I used to do mechanic work. And I asked what the symptoms were, and I said, Sounds like you lost your alternator, your battery went dead, you had no more spark, and it died. Oh, man, I don't know what to do. No tow trucks back then. I said, well, let me tow you to my house. It was really funny. I've got this little Japanese car that could barely get itself down the road, and I'm towing this big Buick you know, this, with a family in it. So I had the thing wide open in first gear. I got, I got them to our house, and Sure enough, it was the alternator brushes. And I said, look, I know where I can get some. Even though it's Christmas Eve, I can fix it for you, but not till tomorrow. And they spent the night. Baptist pastor. Lovely family. Wife, two daughters. Couldn't resist. So we started talking theology. <laughs> and as we're visiting, and he said, well, I know you guys believe hell a little different. And I said, I believe it like the Bible. And I started going through some verses. I said, you know, it says perish. It says consumed, it says devoured, it says ashes, it says burnt up. And I said, uh, you know, do you really believe? And he said, he kind of like looked to the right and left. He thought his family might be listening. He said, Pastor Doug, I've seen these verses before and I can see where you're coming from and it makes sense. But if I told my congregation that they're not going to burn forever and ever, they wouldn't come to church. I said, brother, you mean they're coming for fire insurance? <laughs> I said, are they coming because they love God or they're afraid of the fire? He had to think about that. 
How many people do you know, they're not coming to church because they love God, they're afraid they might burn? Now, the Bible talks about the punishment of the wicked, and the Bible talks about the wonders of heaven, but really, the best reason to serve God is because you love Him. Because if you're only serving God so you won't go to hell, should you get to heaven, you have lost your motivation for serving Him. You say, oh, I'm, I'm, home, I'm home free now. I don't have to serve God anymore. I escaped hell. That's not the way it works, friends. You want to serve Him because you love Him. That's got to be the reason. It says the wicked will perish. It says like the um, splendor of the meadows, they will vanish into smoke. They will vanish. You've seen smoke. We just had it a minute ago. It's vanished. Disappears. It's gone. It's forgotten. It says the wicked do not come into mind. Again, Malachi chapter 4, last chapter in the Old Testament. Behold, the day is coming that will burn as an oven. And all the proud, how many? All the proud, that means the lost, and all who do wickedly, all the lost and proud and wicked, will be stubble, and the day that comes will burn them up. What's left when something's burned up, says the Lord? It will leave them neither root nor branch. If you get rid of the root and the branch of a plant, is it coming back? Root or branch. You will trample the wicked, for they will be what? Ashes under the soles of your feet. You're not going to be talking to them like the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. They're gone. They're decomposed. They're going to be made into plants and new things. Speaking of the devil, if anyone deserves to burn forever, what does it say in Ezekiel 28 about the devil? Therefore I brought a fire from your midst. It devoured you. I turned you to ashes upon the earth. You shall be a terror and never shall you be anymore. You shall be no more forever. Apologize for the hesitation because I have all these verses memorized in King James and I think we're giving you New King James, which is a good version, but sometimes it's hard to break old habits. I used to go to sleep every night, and I'd listen to Alexander Scorby. He, he, you know, he read the whole Bible through on records years ago. Finally went to tape and then CD, and I listened to that for years, and so I got all the King James memorized in my Bible. But some of you are thinking, Pastor Doug, aren't there some verses that talk about uh, eternal fire? Or they're talking about unending Forever and ever? What does that mean? I think you should look at that. Now, first of all, whenever you're trying to understand truth, if I've got a great big white board here in front of me, you know, you've seen those white boards you write on? Great big white board up here, and the whole board is white. And I take one of those markers, a black, you know, temporary marker, and I put a black dot on it, and I ask you, what color is the board? What are you going to say? It's white. You might say, well, but, but there is that black dot. Even if I put three dots... The preponderance of evidence in the Bible is that the wicked die and perish. They do not have everlasting life. They are not immortal. That's what the Bible teaches. People turn it around and they focus all their intention on a couple of verses that are difficult, but we're going to address those because we don't want you to have any doubts. Don't build your theology on the, the oddities. Build your theology on the preponderance of evidence. For one thing, just look at the logic of it. A loving God creating creatures in his own image. He says that I love you, I want to save you. Where is the justice in burning somebody for zillions of years, screaming in agony for the sins of a microscopic period of time by comparison? What is 70 years? Or like I said, person dies at 20. What's 20 years? compared to a billion years of burning. I can't get my mind wrapped around that teaching. And I meet people all the time, they say, well, I know it's what our pastor says, but I've never bought it. Because I don't see it in the Bible, and I just can't love God with that in my mind. It just doesn't seem like Jesus. Two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, Jesus was on his way from Nazareth to Jerusalem for a feast, and he was going to go through... Um, a certain Samaritan town. He sent the disciples to see if he can get a hotel. And they came back and they said, they're not going to give you a hotel because you're going to worship in Jerusalem. Lord, give us the power of Elijah. We will call fire down from heaven upon them. Just say go and we'll do it. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. He said, I did not come to destroy men's lives but to save them. They, you know, Jesus, that's not the way he is. He's not out to try to get us and burn us and torture us. 
But what about those verses? Let's look at them. Question number five. I hope you're following along in your lessons. What about those verses describing the wicked being tormented forever? There are some difficult verses. For example, look at what it says about Jonah. Jonah went to the belly of the fish. He was swallowed. And it says he was in the fish's belly for three days and three nights. And in chapter 2 of Jonah, verse uh, 6, it says, I went down to the moorings, that means the bottom, of the mountains. Uh, um, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. How long does he say the earth with its bars closed behind him? Forever. How long was he in the fish? Three days and three nights. It tells you that in the same chapter. So why does it say forever? Now I suppose if you were swallowed by a fish and you were in the digestive sy system of a fish that maybe had, had sushi as an appetizer and, and it's dark and uh, you maybe got you know, jellyfish stinging you and it could have been really bad trying to sleep on a blubber mattress for three days and three nights. Would it have seemed like forever? Yeah. But was it forever? No. It was three days and three nights. For the wicked, some may burn. I don't know how long. It says the devil day and night, he's going to burn the longest, but even he is brought to ashes, the Bible says. Again, Hannah brings baby Samuel to the temple. She tells Eli the priest, I'm dedicating my child to the Lord. Listen to what she says. Uh, she tells her husband first, she says, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. What does she call as long as he lives? Forever. Sometimes the term forever simply meant the rest of your life. The people who are put in the lake of fire and are burnt and it says forever and ever. In Greek, it's from the word eon. Eon was an unspecified period of time. Have you ever heard someone say, well, I haven't seen them in eons. Have you heard that expression before? That's an unspecified period of time because it's different for every person based on what their, their works are. Everyone's rewarded differently. But it doesn't mean never-ending that all through eternity there's going to be a torture chamber where your lost family or friends are out there burning. Wouldn't that be hard to enjoy heaven and have God wipe away all tears from our eyes? And you could say, yeah, too bad. Half my family's burning in the lake of fire. Doesn't bother me. Jesus dried my tears. If the Lord doesn't want anybody to perish and it breaks his heart, then what would he do? Erase all natural affection from us so we wouldn't care? No. Bible says... They are turned to ashes. Never will they be anymore. Number six. Is there a place called purgatory? Answer? You've heard of purgatory. Purgatory comes from the same word as purge. It means in Catholic theology this idea that some people when they die, uh, I'm not talking about limbo now, purgatory is like you, 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 you've got to pay for some of your own sins. So to get you good enough for heaven, if there's any little lingering remnants of sin, we're going to take you through a fire and you're going to burn. But if you pay the priest enough, do you know that you could actually pay the priest to pray prayers to get a person out of purgatory sooner? I remember when uh, John Lennon died, Yoko Ono went to a priest and asked, if uh, they could pray him out of purgatory. And they said, no, his sins are too bad because he said that they were as important as Jesus. And it really gave the priests the power to say that they could decide how long a person was going to burn in purgatory. But do we pay for our sins? Or did Jesus do that? It says the Son of Man came to give his life a what? Who paid the ransom, us or him? We don't pay. The idea that we're going to earn our way to heaven by burning that God's going to say I'll, I'll suffer some and I'll make you suffer some and then we'll call it even no no Jesus took the penalty for all of our sins now you may suffer and go through trials to help develop character in this life or as a witness in some way but the idea that once you die now you've got to earn some of your forgiveness that's totally contrary to what Jesus taught the Bible says 1 Corinthians 7 33 you were bought with a price who paid the price Jesus. It's like that song we used to sing in a Pentecostal church. 
I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And so Jesus paid our debt. Number seven, will the lost ever be resurrected after they're destroyed in hellfire? Answer, do not fear those who kill the body, but they cannot kill the what? The soul, but rather fear him who will destroy both, what? Soul and body in hell. What happens in that lake of fire? Revelation 20 calls it the second death. And, and I know it says the devil is going to be burned day and night forever and ever. And that's in our chapter 14 of Revelation. That's why we're studying this. What does that mean? Later it says second death. Second death means after they're punished for what they deserve, it's a death from which there is no resurrection. They turn to ashes. They are consumed. They are devoured. They perish. In smoke they vanish away. These are the terms that are used. And Jesus, these are the words of Jesus here in Matthew 10, chapter uh, 10, verse 28. It says, destroy soul and body in hell. What's left? Nothing. Don't worry what man can do. Man can destroy soul and body, but Jesus can destroy soul and body in hell. And that's what's going to happen to the lost. The Bible's pretty clear that the whole earth is going to be purified all outside the New Jerusalem. See, when you read in Revelation chapter 20, at the end of the 1,000 years, when we're caught up to the mansions Jesus prepared, right? John 14, you all with me? I go to prepare a place in my Father's house, many mansions, I'll come receive you to myself, where I am you may be. We go up. We're living and reigning with Christ. It's like a thousand year Sabbath, if you will. And we'll be with Him. At the end of that 1,000 years, it says the rest of the dead, Revelation 20, do not live again till the thousand years are finished. It also says the new Jerusalem comes down. And it says in Zechariah 14, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. It's the only time Jesus' feet touch the world is at the end of the 1,000 years. He will call the wicked who have ever lived all from their graves for this great judgment. The devil and all the wicked come out of their graves. Do they come out repentant and sorry? Or do they come out of their graves ready to listen to the devil who rallies Gog and Magog? That's the biblical terms for God's enemies. Gog and and Magog means from the matrix of Gog. Gog and the children of Gog. Like Babylon and her daughters. And they're all resurrected. And he musters them to attack the city of God. Christ ascends above the city on his great white throne. And ultimately they will abandon their assault. Because their lives will then pass before them in the heavens. This is that great white throne judgment. And everybody's going to be present there. All of the good, the saved, the righteous angels are in the city. God the Father, Son, and Spirit. The devil, fallen angels, and all the lost who've ever lived are outside the city. It says in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, they cover the earth like a cloud, like the sand of the sea. That's what it says also in Revelation chapter 20. And this is your great white throne judgment. Now sometimes people picture the white throne judgment and they think that you got a ticket like you're at the DMV. And you're waiting for 45 minutes or an hour to have them caught. One by one, you go up and then you get judged. At Pentecost, could the Lord save 3,000 people at one time? Can God judge billions of people at one time where their lives pass before them? They see all the times in their lives they had opportunity and they closed the door to the Holy Spirit or God was sending them messages or protecting them, or providing for them, trying to get their priorities straight, turn them away from their sin, and they kept refusing and pushing God away. They'll see that he was just. Do you know that the day comes where it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the saved and the lost that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even the devil himself will ultimately have to kneel before God and say that he was righteous. And then after that, Satan once again tries to rally them and it says they turn on the devil and the fallen angels. And they say, you deceived us, and they'll turn on each other. And it talks about the, the, um, the kings make war against the whore. Revelation 17, they all turn on each other. There's this final thing where it's hopeless, and they sort of implode. It's kind of like the battle where Jehoshaphat was attacked by the Edomites, Moabites, and Ammonites. When he got there, they all turned on each other, and they wiped each other out. I don't know if you remember that story in the Bible. And then God rains fire down upon the wicked, and it continues to rain 
until it makes a lake of fire all outside the city. The Bible says the walls of the New Jerusalem are 214 feet thick, 144 cubits. And um, he purifies the planet. People will suffer different periods of time based on what they deserve. But then on the ashes of the purified world, God makes a new heaven and a new earth. This is how it's going to happen. This is how it's described in the Bible. Will hellfire ever go out? Answer. Isaiah 47, verse 14. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. There's nothing left, friends. The fire goes out. What about the phrase in the Bible that says unquenchable fire? Well, it uses that same phrase in Jeremiah chapter 17. It tells the people that if you refuse to honor the Sabbath day and stop carrying your burdens in and out of the gates on the Sabbath day, then the gates of the city will be burned with unquenchable fire. Read it for yourself in Jeremiah 17. It uses the term unquenchable fire. Revelation's drawing from that same chapter. They did not listen to the Lord. They continued to break His laws. Nebuchadnezzar came, burnt the city, burnt the gates, and the fire was not quenched. Meaning, what does quench mean? It's a verb. It means to extinguish. There's nobody running around heaven like firemen with a hose extinguishing the flames. That's all that means. Unquenchable fire means nobody can put it out until it's done its work. Now, there are four words that are used in the Bible for the term hell. And uh, that's probably a good lead-in for this next question. Where will hellfire be located? Here are the four words in the Bible, New and Old Testament. Old Testament, principally, you've got the word sheol. Sheol just means the place of darkness. Typically, it means the grave. Uh, for example, King David said, You will not suffer my soul to be left in sheol. Jesus was not left in the grave. He did not suffer corruption, just the grave is what that means. Then you've got the word Hades, which kind of comes from Greek mythology. Pluto was the god in charge of Hades. It was, uh, you've heard of the hounds of hell. That's all Greek mythology. Then you have the word Tartarus, which is used one time in the Bible. That just means a place of darkness where the angels are kept in everlasting chains of darkness, Tartarus. Then you've got the word that is Gehenna. This is the word that often confuses people. Outside of Jerusalem was a valley called the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, better known as Gehenna. It's a very steep valley. You can see it today. Still got the same name. Because it was steep and it wasn't good for farming or building, it became the city dump by default. And all the garbage, things were rotten, baskets that were broken, dead bodies of unclean animals were thrown out there they tried to keep fires going there because it kept the smell down and you all know fire kind of helps up in the hills where we live. I've got a burn barrel. Things that can burn, I burn them. Otherwise, I'd be hauling paper things to town all the time. How many of you did that growing up? Okay, thanks. You're in this with me now. We've got a camera shot. <laughs> We're destroying the environment. Anyway, so, but uh, you know, and it's really mentioned, it's worth mentioning this. I, I used to live in Texas where every 10 miles there's a town. You have all these farming towns every 10 miles in Texas. They all had a dump, city dump. And people would burn their stuff in a burn barrel. Sometimes it wasn't completely burned. They'd go dump it and it would catch the dump on fire. But it was okay because they let the dump burn. And every now and then on a clear day, you'd see these wisps of fire going up forever and ever. Did you catch that? That means out of sight. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. It just means out of sight. That's all that means. You'd see the smoke going up because the dump was burning. Jesus said, you're better entering heaven. He says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. Your right eye, your right foot, pluck it out, cut it off. Better entering heaven without an eye, hand, or a foot than going to Gehenna, hell, with a whole body, where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. Gehenna was full of worms and smoldering. He says, Better going to heaven, missing a limb, than be going to the unclean place, the dump, full of worms and fire. And Jesus is using these two radical opposites to make a point. He's not saying that we're going to the city dump. 
But that's why he used the wording where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He probably said that from the Mount of Olives where he could point right at it. He said, you're better off anything in your life. You've got a sin and you think, oh, I can't let go of this. Cut it off. Pluck it out. Stop it. What profit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? Does that make sense? That's what he's talking about. So where is hellfire located? In Sacramento. <clears throat> Everywhere on the earth. Some places hotter than others. <laughs> Very close to the capital. <laughs> says they went up on the breadth of the where? The earth. It's not down yonder somewhere. And they surround the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and did what? Devoured them. It's on the earth. God said to Satan in the book of Job, where'd you come from? He said, I came from walking up and down and to and fro on the earth. People think, where's the devil? He's down there. He's down yonder. Hell is, you know, they, Greek mythology, they had this Vulcan god. And our concepts of hell today is a commingling of Greek and Roman mythology and Christianity. The idea, and the priests, you know, they made a fortune on this. Telling people, you know, only we can pray you out of purgatory and if you disobey us, we're gonna, you're going to go to hell and burn forever. They use fear to manipulate people. God doesn't want to manipulate people with fear. How often did Jesus say, fear not, fear not, fear not, little flock. Peace. And it's just so contrary to trying to motivate uh, Christian people with terror. God is not a terrorist, amen? He wants us to be motivated by love. That's what changes the world. It's going to burn on earth. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works in it will be burned up. Talk about the old earth is burned up. God makes it new. Starts over. We'll get to watch it. And it says, these things will be dissolved, being on fire. All the sin is going to be purified from the planet. Number 10. After hellfire has done its work of destruction, what will Jesus do for his people? This turns into some really good news, friends. Answer, behold, I create new heavens, new earth, and the former will not be remembered or come into mind. There's no torture chamber rem reminding us for eternity of people's suffering. All things. He says, behold, I make all things new. How many things? All things are new. He's not immortalizing sinners or, or the devil. But we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And Jesus wants you to be righteous and he can make you righteous. He can save you from your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Amen? And again, now I saw a new heaven. This is Revelation 21, verse 1. And a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Behold, I make all things new. The Bible promises the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that fear him. Are you reading that? I just misquoted. You've got to watch pastors. They'll pull things on you. People just say, oh, the pastor said it. It must be true. What's that say? Fear him or love him? The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's got to be the reason to serve God. He died to save you from sin. Is there a lake of fire? Yes. Is hell hot? Yes. Matter of fact, my hell is hotter than most Baptist hells. Baptist hell just sort of cooks you slowly forever. Mine burns you up. So there is a hell, but the wicked are consumed. They're devoured in the lake of fire. Number 11. How does God feel about the destruction of the wicked? The Bible tells us, I have no pleasure in the death. Of what happens to the wicked? Death. No pleasure in the death of the wicked. There's certainly no justice in burning people forever and ever. He doesn't even have any pleasure in their destruction. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. This is the heart of God speaking to you, friends. Turn ye. Turn ye from your evil ways. Why will you die? Moses pled with the children of Israel. He said, I've set before you this day life and good and blessing and death and evil and cursing. Therefore, choose life. You have a choice. He can't force you to love him. He can't force you to trust him and obey him. He's pleading with us. But he will ultimately, he will put sinners out of their misery. I remember I lived in a cave 
for about a year and a half like a hermit. That's where I found a Bible. I started reading the Bible. I became a Christian after exploring different religions. And um, I had a cat. And it was way up in these desert mountains. And every now and then my cat would catch a mouse. I always felt bad because cats are a little bit sadistic, you know. They, a dog, it finds a mouse and, oh, it's gone. A cat, uh, it kind of plays with it, tortures it, lets it go, makes it try to get away and clobbers it again. And my cat caught a little desert kangaroo mouse, and they're so cute, you know, they hop, and, and I, you know, used to let my cat go through his ritual, and I used to just supplement his diet, but he would catch a lot of his food. And I was cooking dinner one night on my campfire, and Stranger, that was his name, I called him Stranger, because he just showed up one day. And he was, caught a mouse, he wanted me to see, he brought in this little kangaroo rat, and, oh, you know what happened one time? He bought, brought in a mouse, and he was playing with this mouse. And he let it go, and he'd pounce on it. He'd let it go. He'd pounce on it. And a pygmy owl came down to snatch the mouse. And the cat grabbed the owl, and the mouse got away. I just want you to know, sometimes the story ends well, but <laughs> not this time. So he's playing with his mouse, and the thing is dazed. You know, it's been beat up and clawed, and and it went to hop away, and it hopped into my fire. Now listen to you. I'm talking about a mouse. It hurt you to think about a mouse burning. Is that right? You don't even want to see a rat burn. And you think God would do that to his children? I mean, you wouldn't want to do that to your dog. Then Job asks the question, is mortal man more just than God? The Bible tells us, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want us to be saved. A few years ago, I got a letter, 16-year-old girl. She said, Pastor Doug, I have been scared and terrified and anxious my whole life, thinking I'd be lost and burned forever in hell. And I saw your program on the subject, and the first time now, I can love God. She said, it's just, my anxiety is gone, I have peace, and God wants you to have that peace, that He is a just way, even with how He deals with the wicked. Friends, do you think you can trust and love a God like that? More than anything, He wants you to dwell with Him in His kingdom. Is that your desire? Can I pray with you? Loving Lord, I pray that we'll see that you are a God of love and goodness that will love and trust you. Please bless each of these people to have that experience. And those that are watching, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. When's our next meeting? Tomorrow night, friends. You don't want to miss it. You're going to learn how to live 10 days, 10 years longer, 10 years longer, and it's in Revelation. God bless and have a good evening.